Good evening. Um, I have the pleasure to present our next uh, uh, speaker. Uh, good evening and good morning. Uh, we are now going to have a presentation from Ketil Stocknes. Uh, from, uh, he is a senior project leader at Linden. Uh, Ketil is a PhD researcher. Uh, he has one foot in the commercial industry of waste treatment and another in academical research. Uh, Ketil is an applied biologist and expert within ecology and waste related microbiology and food production. The last 11 years, he has led biogas and compost related products in Linden. In 2020, he completed a PhD based uh, on his work called uh, Circular Food. Uh, we will not have any questions uh, or session for questions after Ketil's presentation. So I would recommend you to uh, post the quest your questions in the Q&A and Ketil, he will be uh, able to answer your questions there. So uh, the floor is yours, Ketil. <clears throat> yes, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so today I'm going to show and tell you about um, food waste treatment in Norway, or at least part of Norway, um, where we have um, we have a um, plant which is called the Magic Factory. And um, I hope I'll, I'm able to make you understand why it's called the Magic Factory um, as we go through this presentation. So the Magic Factory is a biogas plant uh, treating food waste and also animal manure. But first of all, um, Lindum, uh, can you take next slide, please? Lindum is situated in the southeast of uh, Norway with several departments around with uh, landfills and treatment plants for various um, various types of waste. Next please. We are operating both within biological processes for uh, organic waste and also different kinds of recycling and environmental uh, technologies such as uh, order um, treatment and so on and also we operate several landfills for typically polluted soil and masses uh, containing heavy metals and organic pollutants and so on. Next, please. In most of Norway now, we have source separation of food waste. And there are basically two types. Um, one is a system where we have several bags, uh, a green bag for uh, food waste and a blue bag for plastic waste and uh, other kinds of shopping bags for residual waste. And all these kinds of wastes are put into the same uh, bin and then brought to an optical sorting plant where um, food waste is, is um, separated, put into to, uh, trucks that are uh, transport this to different um, treatment plants. The other kind of uh, system is using separate containers. And in these cases, biodegradable bags are used. So either biodegradable plastic bags or paper bags. And I can say that it seems now that the, the lower system in this uh, slide is the, the system that works best um, because it stimulates the highest percentage of source separation of food waste. And there is, of course, some technical challenges as well with the optical sorting system and bags that uh, open and leak out the food waste and so on. So you can say that uh, the lower alternative is the best. Next slide. We've also been discussing mechanical biological treatment of residual waste. And you can say that um, this has not been very uh, successful because 
the, the bio waste which is extracted is not clean enough for, for, um, for using it in, in agriculture. So the, you can say that um, it has been uh, considered by many areas and also many countries in the EU and so on, but has been mostly abandoned. And now uh, the general policy is to go for um, source separation at the consumer level. Next, please. This is the, the, the bunker where we receive the food waste in, uh, at the magic factory. And as you can see, there is still uh, plastic because this, these green bags that come from the optical sorting system, they are actually um, traditional plastic, non-degradable plastic. So, and, and other bags uh, come into the same bunker, which are biodegradable. And even some uh, objects present here, you can see that shouldn't be there. But all these things, they are sorted out in a mechanical treatment system. So if you take the next slide, please. So this is an overview of the magic factory. And you can see at the left, what we, what we do here is that we actually put in the food waste, or we can say we put in a rotten tomato in one end, and we take out fresh tomatoes in the other end because we have developed a cultivation system, a closed um, controlled environment uh, cultivation system for vegetables, which I will explain a little bit in more detail. Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> and the Magic Factory is um, taking in both food waste uh, from 1.2 million people in Norway and also animal manure which contributes the, the liquid in the factory um, and no water is used. So it's only liquid animal manure and food waste. Then this is pasteurized or sanitized, you can say, and um, digested into biogas. And the biogas is separated into CO2 and methane or biomethane. And you can say that the carbon in the waste is leaving the plant as either methane or as CO2. And we are using the CO2 into the um, controlled environment agriculture. This is a pilot that can, you can see on the right side, a 1000 square meter um, greenhouse pilot, where most of it is a test facility to demonstrate this kind of closed production. And the other part is a visitor teaching center where uh, pupils, children and youth come in to learn about a uh, circular economy. And in this greenhouse, in the process, we are also using the digestate or the biofertilizer, we call it. Most of the volume is now used in open field agriculture for growing grains and, and feed for animals, but part of it is also used in the greenhouse. So we have plans for scaling up these greenhouses um, up to 10 hectares. And the, the system is based on only on waste in that we are using um, uh, a compost as a growing medium uh, from green waste or garden waste. So the effect is that this is a completely circular kind of approach to making use of all uh, the elements in the food waste. Next slide. This is the, the digester residue or the digestate as it's called, and it can be separated uh, into a liquid and a solid part. What we are doing is only a kind of rough uh, screening or, or um, filtration of this, uh, this digestate and that leads to a um, rather small part of uh, solids. Unfortunately, the mechanical pretreatment process is not perfect, so some pieces of plastic follow into the solid part. As you can see here in the picture, the green bags uh, uh, can be, you can see the, the residues of it in the, in the solid part and we are currently 
um, developing a method to separate out these, uh, these residues. At the same time, we are working upstream of the process to uh, make all, um, all communities around use the biodegradable bags so we can avoid having this plastic contamination in our product. Next slide. So I've been quite often making the point about uh, our, the relevance of space research, because when we go to, to Mars, we have to make a completely closed circular system to sustain ourselves. And that research and that way of thinking is very relevant for how we should develop cities to grow food um, in a circular way. Next. This is the European Space Agency's loop uh, developed for space. And as you can see, there, there, it's not only a matter of using the waste into a greenhouse to grow plants, but there are several other components necessary to degrade this waste and make um, the nutrients available for new food production. And of course, this is a, a very complicated microbial system, but it's very relevant for how uh, a closed systems can be developed. Next slide, please. In, um, there, there is a huge trend now towards plant factories or um, vertical uh, growing systems in, in cities, as you can see one example of here. Um, the trouble is with these plants is they are not really circular. They are based on mineral fertilizers and a lot of power use. So even though they are efficient in terms of nutrient use and, and um, water use and so on, they are not really developed for a circular way of thinking. And that is what exactly what we have done at the Magic Factory to develop another way of growing crops in a controlled environment based on waste. Next slide. So you can see here at the right part of this diagram, you have the, the degradation, the anaerobic degradation, and you also have several other organisms that are necessary to convert the waste. Next slide. And at the Magic Factory, we have actually exact the same components of the system and the same connections and arrows of how this works as in the space system. Next. This is a, show a video wow. from the greenhouse. Wow. Showing that this is a completely different system from wow. ordinary greenhouse growing that we are using earthworks. Yes. So there is a kind of full ecological system. Um, wow. In the growing system consists of, yes, of yes. compost and worms that are, um, uh, yeah, you, you get less disease wow. and a more efficient production system. If you want to use the digestate for growing crops, this is a, a way to do it that works. And from this uh, pilot greenhouse, we are now selling these climate tomatoes or magic tomatoes from the magic factory. And they have been received very well in the market. People are asking for these tomatoes again and again because the quality is extremely high. They have a lot of taste and a very good structure. And they are uh, locally produced and picked uh, at the mature stage. So yeah, they taste very nice. Next slide. We've also done a lot of research on growing mushrooms from the waste. And uh, this is uh, planned for also for scaling up. They're not magic mushrooms, but we can could call them magic mushrooms from the magic factory. Next. So you can say that the waste pyramid also uh, holds for organic waste. So in terms of uh, talking about waste reduction, that can be things like plant shopping um, and meals well and eat up your food. 
Next or reuse of food waste at one level, at the home uh, household level, could be make beer from your dry bread and use leftovers in new dishes at home. Or you can even grow mushrooms on coffee grounds. Next, material recovery uh, can be using digestate and compost for plant crops like we do at the Magic Factory. And of course, biogas, biogas digestion or anaerobic digestion is a very efficient way of material recovery, not only energy recovery, but material recovery of food waste because it's a closed process conserving all the nutrients. While composting is um, not as optimal as anaerobic digestion because you lose a lot of the nutrients during the composting process. Next. And of course, incineration of food waste or lamp filling is the absolutely worst thing you can do. Next, please. Yes. Um, if you want to convert food waste materials most efficiently to new food, uh, we can look at different fractions. So when you have food quality residues and byproducts, pre-consumer that is, they can be converted to new food through novel biotransforming technology, like for example, um, extracting uh, proteins from, um, from um, carcasses of chicken or things like that. While the waste is still food quality, it should be converted directly into new food. Next, mixed food waste, next please. Um, is a broad biochemical substrate for heterotrophic food production. So for example, mushroom production or insect production are very appropriate uh, methods to convert food waste. However, there is some challenge with the legislation, but I will come back to that next. And lignocellulosic materials, such as dry materials, they are carbon and energy uh, rich uh, sources for heterotrophic food production as well, or sustainable growth media for plants. Next, animal manure um, is an organic, can be used as an organic plant uh, fertilizer or as microbial nutrients uh, for for yeah and wastewater treatment plant material uh, sludge next is the same thing however if you push double if you take the next please and the next um the thing is that these wastes they are uh, to a to a varying degree appropriate for both biogas digestion and for using in uh, using this way that I'm I'm explaining, because the um, the in Europe at least you cannot use mixed wastes directly for uh, insect production, for example, because of the le legislation. And you cannot use wastewater treatment plant sludge for uh, growing vegetables in the field, for example, and so on. There is a lot of uh, challenge around the legislation for doing this. So the optimal way biologically is not necessarily the, the, the possible way to do it. Next, please. We are also looking into more local cycles at the urban, uh, in the urban environment, because this way of thinking, using uh, food waste uh, for biogas production and for vegetable production can also be done locally. Um, and we have calculated that you can produce a substantial uh, amount of the vegetable, vegetables needed for, for the inhabitants in this way by combining um, greenhouses and other kinds of climate controlled uh, growing systems. And it, it can be both um, community level um, on volunteer, uh, vo uh, volunteer basis or professional growing. Yes, thank you. That was the last slide. Thank you, Ketil, for a very interesting uh, presentation.
um, as I said uh, before, we, uh, we will not be able to, to ask you questions, but please uh, write the questions in the Q&A and Katie will be able to answer it. We really need more of these magical factories, that's for sure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, we will then move to the, the session of uh, urban strategies for food waste. Um, good evening and good morning for the new new you of you who are coming in now. Uh, I will now. Uh, um, uh, uh, in this session, uh, we are going to uh, talk about uh, uh, urban strategies for food waste, and we are going as we are going from value chains to to value circles or loops. Uh, it requires that we have to rethink industry, products, business models, and uh, consumption. Uh, we need to reset our mindset and change habits as officials, CEOs, employees, and consumer. And this has to happen uh, fast if we are going to reach the climate goals. And waste uh, is a key word in this context. And it's estimated that uh, the waste uh, in for, within the food production is almost one third of food produced. And uh, food waste is a symptom of uh, a food system that is not working. And in order to make a change, uh, we need to approach the whole food system at once and include all the different stakeholders, uh, industry, consumers, retails, and the public, uh, and authorities, not at least. And it's also important to, to have the action plan as place-based uh, because there is no one size fit all uh, and there need the different solutions to solve the, the waste challenge. But we need uh, to cooperate uh, and uh, use technology experience and know-how uh, to, to come up to speed. And um, it's not maybe much we can do each and everyone, but together we can make a change. Uh, I will now uh, present the panelists. Um, we have four, four panelists here today. And I would like to start presenting uh, Mr. Christopher Tan. Uh, he is a director of uh, the sustainability divisions at National Environmental Agency in Singapore. Uh, Mr. Tan is responsible for strategies and programs to drive sustainable waste to resource management. Uh, in previous roles, he has uh, worked on issues such as vector control operations, air quality policies, and applied research in the behavioral science as well as environmental and resource economics. Christopher started his career as an economist at the Ministry of Trade and Industry, Singapore. And uh, then we will hear from uh, the speaker from Norway. Uh, that will be Mr. Ole S. Röd. He is a founder and CEO at Norsk Biogas. He, uh, his education is within economy, marketing and management. He has uh, 30, more than 30 years uh, of experience in sales and marketing and management both in Norway and internationally. He is an expert in, uh, has expertise in business modulation strategy and cooperationalization, operationalization, experience from M&A processes, corporate and project financing. He has been instrumental in, uh, in establishing new independent companies as a founder and co-founder since year 2000. Uh, Mr. Rudd has and have had several board positions within industry, finance, IT, recycling and re renewables energy since 1990. Uh, after we heard, uh, heard from uh, uh, Mr. Rudd, we will hear from a speaker from Singapore, uh, which is Mrs. Um, Kaining Chua. She is a co-founder and CMO in Insecta Singapore. 
Kaning is a passionate ento entrepreneur who believes that the smallest of creatures can make the biggest of impacts. As a co-founder of Insecta Singapore's first BSF biotech company, she aspires to marry deep tech innovations together with nature to create technologies that extract valuable ketosan, melanin, and more from the BSF to increase the value of the growing insect farming industry. Last uh, but not the least, we have Mr. Roy Olaf Hovlit, Sales and Marketing Manager at Fjell Technologies. Uh, Roy is a fish health biologist. He has 10 years experience in the pharmaceutical industry, specializing on aquaculture, vaccine, sea lice, treatment, antibiotics. Uh, seven years in commercial director, business unit manager of companies like Intervet, Intervet share, sharing plug animal health and MSD animal health. Roy was innovation director of Reaper and Sun Norway, which is a food manufacturing company, and he was founder and managing director of uh, of uh, oh, I'm missing something here. Yeah, of um, startup in 2019, and is currently the sales and marketing manager at Field Technology Group AS. I will now give the floor to Christopher, please. Hey, thank you, Sigurdu. Um, I'm glad to be on the panel today. As yeah, Sigurdu uh, mentioned, um, I am from the National Environment Agency in Singapore, and the National Environment Agency's aim and mission is to have a clean, sustainable, and green environment for Singapore for current and future generations. I will speak a bit about uh, our plans for waste uh, that will form a backdrop for this, uh, for, to try to talk about food waste. So um, in 2019, we developed uh, the Zero Waste Master Plan. What did the Zero Waste Master Plan aim to do? It tried to move away from the linear economy of uh, production, consumption, and disposable to take, make, and dispose um, to a new circular economy, which is on the next slide. So the Zero Waste Master Plan lays out Singapore's strategies for zero waste nation with important roles for the government, business and community in order to build a sustainable, resource efficient and climate resilient nation. So on the left of this slide, we can see um, how a linear economy could turn into a circular economy. There are various loops that we can uh, try to implement, such as uh, to reduce buying, repair and reuse, recycling um, and redistribution. And in general, the smaller the loop, the better. We also have targets under the Zero Waste Master Plan. In Singapore, we only have one landfill, one offshore landfill. At some, it's called Samakau Landfill off the southwest of Singapore. We, currently, we uh, project that it will run out of space in 2035. So we are doing our best. We must do our best to extend its lifespan beyond then. To do so, we are aiming to reduce the amount of waste sent to, sent to landfill per capita per day by 20% by 2026 and 30% by 2030. I mean, these are Singapore's plans that are in support of the Zero Waste Master Plan, as well as the Singapore Green Plan, uh, the overall plan for sustainable development, which was released at the early this year to chart out Singapore's uh, sustainable development plans for the next 10 years till 2030. So how does Singapore plan to reduce the amount of waste sent to landfill per, per capita per day? Um, the next slide, please. Uh, we are focusing on several key waste streams, particularly e-waste, uh, packaging waste, including plastics, which was the topic of the previous panel, and uh, food waste, which is the topic of this panel, and also um, a campaign and effort to get Singapore to recycle right, which means to reduce contamination. So we want Singaporeans to recycle more of these key waste streams as well as to recycle right. I will then talk a bit about food waste now. Uh, so we may, be, we may have um, read that uh, according to the estimates by the Food and Agricultural Organization, um, global food waste and food loss amounts to about 1.3 billion tons. So that's really a lot. In Singapore uh, in 2020, 
uh, there were 665,000 tons of food waste generated in Singapore. This is about a tenth of all food waste and only 19% of that was recycled. The rest of it was disposed at the waste to energy plants in Singapore for incineration and energy recovery. So you see, um, we want to try to do our best to reduce food waste, raise the recycling rate. So um, reducing food waste, redistributing unsold or excess food and recycling or treating food waste are key approaches in Singapore's food waste and management strategy. And of course, the smallest loop and the best loop to close would be uh, to redistribute unsold or excess food. And uh, at the other end of the treatment spectrum, we have uh, composters um, as well as anaerobic digestion, which can turn food waste into some useful outputs such as compost, uh, non-potable water, which uh, could be used for cleaning purposes, or um, biogas from anaerobic digestion. So um, we also are trying to encourage more of something in between, food waste valorization. Um, so food waste valorization could uh, work at uh, upcycling food waste into useful products such as uh, food to food, food to feed, or food to other products. And this is a new area that we are working on to try to encourage, together with other agencies, such as the Singapore Food Agency and Enterprise Singapore. Uh, so uh, recently, there were food-based valorization awards um, and some examples of uh, food to food um, companies in Singapore, which were given awards at that ceremony, were crushed a local uh, beer brewing company that turns excess food from other companies um, such as uh, uh, bread spent, uh, waste bread um, from, uh, from grocers or bakers and mixes them into the beer, beer brewing process. So that's one food to food process. Another food to food process um, in Singapore is also this uh, wow noodles. Right, so there's this company, Cosmodi Health, uh, which has looked at um, turning spent barley grains uh, into uh, low fiber, zero GI noodles that are also zero waste because if you think about it, spent barley grains might otherwise uh, be disposed of. Some other, and I'm sure that Kining will talk a bit more about Black Soldier Fly technology. Kining's company was also a recipient of um, the recent food valorization awards. Uh, so, um, of course, we these are some ways that we are working at to try to encourage better food waste management in Singapore. And we do hope that these will build uh, together with our other zero waste strategies towards a zero waste nation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thank you very much. Here's my slide. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, allow me to start with uh, an ad additional backdrop of my affiliation with the recycling and waste to energy industry. My first uh, encounter with the industry was back in 1995. At that time, I was employed by an expanding waste management company in Norway, Norsk Genvinning. After years in the advertising and communication business, this was a brand new world to me. At that time, I found the industry rough and dirty and in many ways very immature. However, figures quite rapidly show that waste literally could be turned into gold. Already then, waste was an important driver in what later became the circular, circular economy. Waste carries significant value and contributes to major value creation. I believe this was a consequence of the Brundtland Commission report of a common future that was published in 1987. Already then, the consequences of an unsustainable society were seen. That's 34 years ago. In 2050, we aim to reach a zero emission society. It's only 28 years ahead. Uh, it tells me that we have no time to lose. As you well know, carbon dioxide is one of the four main greenhouse gases caused by basically power generation, transport and mobility, shipping and waste. The ongoing 
decarb decarbonization supported by regulations and incentives turn more and more sectors into electrification, creating an expanding need for electricity. I guess the core of the green shift is transit to alternative power sources to fossil fuel. However, today we know that wind, solar, biomass, and hydropower cannot cover the power gap fast enough. It's a need for increased use of aggregated biomass. Food waste is premium biomass and a far more energy rich addition to traditional agri related biomass sources. However, Utilization of the resource demand efficient technologies and system in use, as well as a well compound value chain to be profitable. The core of this value chain is the pretreatment, where transformation from waste into an energy carrying commodity take place today and forward. Uh, I'm very sure that emerging technologies will open new doors for the utilization of biomass. We will see transformation into a broader variety of energy carriers through gasifiers, pyrolysis, and others, in addition to or in interaction with anaerobic digestion. Also, here, pretreatment will play a decisive role due to the nature of food waste as a resource. In perspective, anaerobic digestion is most beneficial to the green shift. Technologies and systems are well known and tested. Upgraded to biomethane, the gas integrates with present uh, needs, especially within the shipping and heavy transport sector without major replacements or technologies in use. And not to forget, the state from anaerobic digestion of food waste contains several vital nutrition. A further processing of these has the potential to become new inputs to several industries, resources that are as important as energy for our common future. So let me finish off. Food waste is gold in terms of the green shift. Food waste, in my opinion, will never go away. On the contrary, it will step up with increased living standards and an ever-increasing supply of goods. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much for the amazing introduction, Sigrid, and uh, thanks for mentioning me, Christopher. I'm very excited to be here today on the panel. And um, my name is Kai. I'm one of the co-founders of Insector. We are from Singapore. So many of you may have heard about the black soldier fly, but for those of you who have yet to meet this amazing insect, the black soldier fly is a growing superstar of the insect farming industry, known for its ability to consume food waste and valorize it into agriculture products such as insect meal and fertilizer. Now, today I'm going to keep my introduction short so we can go straight to the questions because there's so much to unpack regarding the insect farming industry and what it can be. It's still a very new, very niche industry. And over here in sector, we are developing technologies to expand the black soldier flies horizon beyond just agriculture. So what we do is we create proprietary processes to extract kytosan, melanin and probiotics and even more from this amazing insect. And we are serving the pharmaceutical, bioelectronic and personal care industries. Now, the work that Insecta is doing has allowed us to imagine new scenarios that we've never seen before, such as the ability to harness insects to, against the fight against COVID-19, for example, or use them in biodegradable as well as biocompatible electronics. Now, in brief, how this works is that the black soldier fly, they consume food waste very fast, very aggressively. They grow very quickly as well and then they are harvested for use. Now, traditionally, the larvae and the fresh, which is, which is the insect pool, are the materials that um, the industry takes out. But now with our technology, we can take out things like chitosan and melanin. 
Now, in brief, what these stuff, these materials are, for example, kaitosan, I have some examples over here. Okay, kaitosan is a substance known for its antimicrobial and moisturizing properties, while melanin, which I have some examples over here, it's actually a natural pigment that what makes our hair black, um, as well as our skin tan. But far from being an ordinary pigment, melanin is also known to conduct electronic, uh, conduct electricity, um, diagnose and treat certain cancers, as well as serve as a bio scaffold in bone healing. So today, um, the questions I'd be happy to take are those related to insect-assisted waste valorization, uh, the insect tech industry, uh, social and economic attitudes towards insects, as well as how we can harness insects as the next sustainable source of high-value biomaterials. Thank you so much. Yes, hello. Uh, I'm Roy Ula from uh, Fial Technology, from Fial Technology Group. Uh, give a small introduction to our uh, company. Uh, we are involved in many fields that are relevant for the topic here today. Uh, we are a company with, uh, that grew out from the oil and gas industry that we still have some, as you can see uh, from this slide, some activity towards but it's not longer a priority. In 2012, this, we decided to have a sort of a green shift inside our own company and, uh, and try to contribute to help the world uh, become, uh, making a smaller footprint and uh, become greener. So one of our primary uh, business fields is uh, wastewater treatment. So we are both involved in uh, municipal wastewater. We have delivered municipal wastewater plants for both Mecca in Saudi Arabia and Monza in Italy. And we have, our own, have an ongoing project now in Dordrecht in Holland. Uh, and we develop our own dryers and dewatering equipment for that purpose. Uh, it's a small picture, but one of our priorities now is also uh, towards the fish and aquaculture industry, where we co uh, deliver complete solutions. And even uh, what we call an eco capture system, which uh, is run without use of uh, chemicals or polymers, uh, where we treat the water from um, uh, down to 0.1% dry matter or below and take it up to dry powder. And we are involved in a project in Singapore with this type of uh, eco capture system. Uh, we also uh, have involvement in uh, drying of biogas, uh, which has been uh, talked about earlier today. And, um, as you can see from the other slide, we also have a strong involvement in CO2 capture. Uh, we have recently sold a company to Baker and Use, and we have another technology under development. So we are really trying to take part in the green shift. Uh, on the right side, you can see uh, one of the other main focus of our company, which is mentioned here as protein recycling, which is very relevant for today's topic. Um, with protein recycling, we take primarily fish waste, but also insects. Uh, we can also take the uh, faces from insects and dry that up. But uh, the primary focus is fish waste, fish cuttings, uh, heads, bones, trimmings. Uh, we can, and we can even use blood and uh, guts. And we make high valuable uh, fish meal and oil, rich in omega-3 uh, fatty acids uh, in the oil. Uh, we, ha we have a strong presence in this uh, market in uh, Japan, but uh, our primary market is, of course, Europe. And we have had several meetings with uh, Innovation Norway and uh, industry representatives and national government representatives in Singapore discussing the potential for a national fish meal and oil plant, which I think there is a very good um, uh, platform uh, to, uh, to build such a solution for food waste. You have a small uh, country area and you're a very modern country. And as discussed in previous meetings uh, initiated by Innovation Norway, we have also uh, had a little glance at uh, Tokyo where the government has forbidden to throw away fish waste. So every day, 130 cars are driving out to restaurants, markets in Yukashima, Tokyo area, and collecting fish waste and bringing it to a central fish meal and oil plant, where they are making then food for production animals. So this is a very interesting 
potential for Singapore, even though it demands a lot of effort and collaborations. Our core competence is uh, the drying technology. So we are involved in many areas not mentioned here, but uh, we are have a strong R&D backbone uh, where we are investing in uh, new possibilities, new technologies, new uh, process, uh, process uh, optimizations. So uh, as an ending, I can also say we are, we are also involved with leading R&D environments in Norway to develop new uh, high valuable products from uh, fish sludge, which is the outcome from aquaculture. We hope there to make a high valuable uh, fuel from the fish sludge. This is together with leading uh, research environments in Norway. So we are involved in many of the topics here today and uh, uh, look forward to discuss them uh, later on and thank you. Thank you so much to, to each and every one of you. Very interesting. Um, uh, I will uh, ask uh, the participants uh, if you want to raise questions to put them in the Q&A and I will, I will pick them up uh, from there or if we are not able to answer them uh, directly, that we will be able to answer them in written afterwards. Okay, um, I have the pleasure to ask you some questions. And I uh, really would uh, say that it's a very impressive plan you have uh, uh, for zero waste in Singapore, uh, Christopher. And uh, I assume that you are now in the process of implementing it. Uh, and uh, you are uh, mentioned that also, uh, Ule, that it is very important uh, in, in the case of waste uh, and utilization of waste, it has to be profitable solutions. And that means that we have to really be able to make uh, valuable products that and make a market for, for uh, uh, waste products or waste-based products. So I was just wondering, uh, Christopher, if you can elaborate a little bit how you as an um, environmental agency and, and owner of, the, of this plan, how you can really um, make it easier or the, the regulatory can make it easier to, to make these uh, high valuable products and make the waste business like uh, profitable. Yeah, uh, thanks, Gudu. And yes, I do know uh, Ula's point and, um, about how the, there must be value in waste. And in fact, um, the business of turning waste through anaerobic digestion to biogas can be a valuable pathway. Yeah, it is a possible pathway and a valuable pathway, pathway and NEA does recognize this. So in 2024 onwards, we are requiring uh, commercial and industrial premises with large amounts of food waste to segregate their food waste for treatment. In uh, some of these sorts of premises, just to give like, some examples will be food mm -hmm. manufacturing businesses, uh, multi-users factories with um, 20 food, with more than 20 food tenants, uh, hotels with food and beverage and function areas, um, shopping malls with shopping malls with uh, food and beverage areas of more than 3,000 per meter square. Yeah, so these are large generators of food waste. So we are requiring them to segregate and treat their food waste. So, um, so that is the first uh, step towards working towards a circular economy for food waste, right? To get uh, segregation done. And treatment uh, then I would say really has to be, uh, there are several options that the companies can use for treatment. I mean, um, NEA is setting up um, this co-digestion facility at the upcoming Tuas uh, Nexus facility in Singapore. So the, at Tuas Nexus, um, there will be, why is it called Nexus? It's because there are several sorts of circular uh, flows of material going on there. There's, um, there's a, water, an, a water treatment plant, which is uh, part of the, uh, Singapore's efforts to close the water loop. There's also a waste to energy plant, uh, which will turn waste uh, and recover it to generate energy, which will also help to power the water treatment plant, um, the water reclamation plant, as we call it in Singapore. And there will also be a food waste uh, treatment facility, which will take sewage sludge from
from the sludge from the from the water reclamation plant and co-digested with food waste. So that is one uh, possible um, place that uh, food waste, large food waste generators, could send the food waste to. I mean, the other option, um, and and I must also add that we do think that co-digestion of sewage sludge with food waste is a very valuable pathway. There's a pilot currently going on at Ulu Pandan Water Reclamation Plant, which has done well, and that is why we're implementing it at TWAS in Singapore. The large, the large generators will also have options. Um, they will be able to choose on-site food waste treatment, if that makes sense, um, such as composting. Just that we are requiring that any new shopping malls which, are, uh, which start the building permission process in 2021 this year, uh, they've already been required to do on-site food waste treatment. But all other facilities, uh, especially the older facilities, will have the option of doing both on-site or off-site. Yeah. Hmm. Ah, quite impressive. Ula? Yeah, uh, Christopher, let me add a few things to your, 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 your comments there. Uh, I, I feel that this is, if you take Singapore uh, and put the, the volumes you mentioned in, in, and put it into context there, uh, I've made some, some calculations uh, and we maybe have a little bit uh, differences in, in, in the volume that are generated, but I have figures from 21 that says that you generate approximately 740,000 tons of food waste in, in, in Singapore. Uh, now you said 19% uh, was, was uh, turned into animal feed, or, or you did mention, but uh, I got that from, 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 uh, from NAA. Anyway, uh, it's a tremendous volume of, of food waste. And, uh, and uh, I, I don't think it's larger per capita than we uh, experience in, in, in other countries, uh, maybe less actually, but, uh, but it's a tremendous volume. Um, and just to, 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 to give the audience a little bit of what this is all about, if we turn it into something that are more closer to us is, I think it will be around 7.5 million liters of diesel equivalents if you turn it into energy or 7.5 terawatt hours if you turn it into electricity. And also with AD, if you capture the CO2, I think it's around, and around 20, 21 million kilos of CO2 equivalents. So, so we are talking of a really, really, really big volume. Saying that, um, uh, it's no problem to digest uh, or, or to, to AD uh, waste without doing that much about it. Okay, it generates a lot of, 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 of uh, residues in, in, in the digesters, but, but basically you, you can uh, take out the energy content. Uh, more concerning is that uh, if you take the degustate, uh, normally it's, I guess it's more or less, less equal to the volume you put in. So you will have in this case, then, uh, this calculation, 740,000 tons of, of, of dig estate. And you don't have the space for that, I believe, in Singapore. So you have to look upon it a different way. Uh, and that is, that is my point of view, that you have to look on the value chains and see that you have a smooth uh, move uh, along the along the, 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 the from the, the, the waste holder throughout until you have the, uh, the final products that actually has been turned into a commodity. That, that, that is my point of view, because we are not talking about uh, uh, some sort of uh, my back, backyard uh, composting unit. This is industry size, large industry size. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ula. I, I think that this is what is, makes Singapore maybe very interesting because you have a, uh, huge volumes and small areas. So like issues regarding to lo logistics and things like that uh, is uh, different than in others. Uh, but, uh, Roy, uh, when we were talking together, you were, you were uh, also pointing out exactly the same, that uh, you, you mentioned the case you have in Japan, but also that you, there are opportunities in Singapore just, uh, just because that this is, uh, this is huge volume in, in a small area. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? 
Yeah, we've had um, several meetings uh, initiated, as said, by in Innovation Norway, but we have had meetings with HICEA, that is a big food produce, uh, seafood pro uh, processor in uh, and Baramundi group, that have already some kind of collaboration. And several government institutions has participated. And the background is, as you say, Sigrid, that uh, Singapore is a very modern country and uh, they have a small, what shall I say, geographical area, uh, which is, of course, ideal for Yukashima, Tokyo. It's a quite big area. Uh, and they are able to collect all this fish waste and, uh, f uh, and bring it to a central processing unit. And it's not um, the highest quality of fish meal and oil, but it is uh, valuable fish meal and oil that are used for production of other animals. And they have a zero waste policy, as uh, you have. Uh, and it's working very nice. It, uh, but it, uh, as me and you discussed, Sigurd, it um, demands, it cannot be uh, like high sea alone or Baramundi alone. It, it demands uh, close collaboration. I think it's a very good thing to have private initiatives like high sea or Baramundi taking the lead. But then you need to have uh, it, uh, the government uh, working along with regulations. And um, uh, for example, it's of high importance to keep the cooling chain. The products coming out as meal or oil will never be better than the quality of the raw material that you put into the process. So there has to be some kind of uh, uh, legislation saying that uh, fish waste should be kept cool. It should be picked up at certain uh, specific hours or brought to specific pickup areas every day and then collected, keeping the cooling chain until it comes to the central fish meal and oil plant. But if you are able to do that, I think Singapore is in a unique position to achieve it. And I remember from this meeting that you have in total around 25,000 tons of uh, fish waste. Uh, and we can use every part of the fish. I read the story about uh, the fish farmer or something like that, uh, producing gray mullet. And he produced 6,000 tons of gray mullet, 3,000 tons it was. and 1,800 of those 3,000 tons were not used in the end product, was not eaten by human, uh, humans. It was, uh, some of it was going to this soup project, but uh, uh, it's 60% of the fish that is not utilized. And it's highly rich in, uh, it, it is good food for both humans and animals. If it was, we were able to have big volumes and process it immediately, we can make human grade food from it. And we can use the bones, the heads, the blood, the cut, uh, trimmings, everything part of the fish can be part of this process. So um, I think it's an interesting um, possibility to look further into. And so does, of course, I think uh, the, the participants that we have been discussing with, both from government and industry and innovation Norway. Hmm. It's, it's, it's uh, interesting. Uh, and uh, Kaining, for for me, your your business or your industry, the insect industry is is quite new, uh, and uh, I think I think when uh, when we were talking because um, you you are not like in the insect industry as such, but you are valorizing the 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 side stream or the waste from that industry, and I think that is that is very very interesting because you are aiming at very high and valuable products. And I was just wondering, um, you know, what have been like the main challenges for a, for a young startup, uh, you know, doing this? You you were really like uh, trying out something new and changing uh, the industry. Mm. Well, yeah. Um, for all young startups, uh, we all face the same challenges, right? Uh, financial. Um, feeling our way around. Um, our team all comes from uh, relevant backgrounds such as the sciences and, and communications. But the thing is, um, the special thing about the insect industry is that it's so new. So all these new startups are not improving an existing model. We are really just uh, beating our way through uncharted territory. And with Insecta, even more so because, um, like you mentioned earlier, rightfully so, we are not an insect farming company like most insect 
um, companies are, what we do is we take the byproducts from insect farming and valorize that into higher value products. And uh, what that does is, number one, gives insect farms a new source of revenue, thus allowing them to grow the industry. And number two, increasing the value of the insect farming industry as a whole, because now we're not just limited to agriculture, we are seeing the, the products that Insecta makes in things like antimicrobial sprays and masks that fight COVID-19, um, as well as cancer treatments and um, bioelectronic uh, circuits. So I think the main challenge that comes with being such a new industry, one is definitely legislative, um, because we don't want to do anything um, under the table. Uh, we want to make sure all our stuff is rightfully licensed. Um, and this is even more important, especially since our stuff is going in pharmaceuticals and medicines, right? That mark of safety, security, and quality is even more important. But since the industry is so new, we have yet to set a lot of guidelines for anything insect related. Yes, we have. Uh, you want to say something? Oh, no, I just please. Uh, I just uh, <laughs> have some addition after you finish your. <laughs> yeah. So, um, with the legislations being so non-existent at the moment, um, I think it's a bit hard for young startups to kind of a framework to know what direction they should go. For example, um, Insecta wanted to go into insects as human food, but when we realized that the legislation for that was so undrafted um we thought it would be better to wait for that industry that that section to develop a bit more before we dip our toes into it so i think legislation finances definitely is a big challenge in in the insect industry i think this is very interesting because when we are talking about the circular economy often we are focusing on the existing value chains and how we can make them circular but in your case, you are working in a, in a, you are establishing like a new industry, a new value chain. And that is uh, the different challenges uh, you are, you are meeting uh, than the, um, than, than the more traditional ones. It both can be positive, but also negative in that sense uh, that uh, it can be very hard to change also something that is very well established. I think uh, what we're doing is twofold. Well, number one, the insect farming industry is going to grow. There's no doubt about that. We are certain that this um, industry is going to be worth billions in just a couple of years. But one of the stumbling blocks, the insect industry farming, is the value that you can derive from it. It mm. is very expensive to create a brand new industry, such as the insect industry. And if the only products we can get out of it are going to be like a singular kind, such as agriculture, you are stifling the value of the industry. When we open up the insect industry to pharmaceuticals, healthcare, um, electronics, and personal wellness, such as cosmetics, um, suddenly this industry becomes a lot more lucrative to go into. Um, this increases investor confidence, increases the players in the field, and helps the industry grow. So I do think the work that Insecta is doing is not just, um, we're not just, uh, focusing on our little value chain over there, we're helping the entire industry, whether it's mealworms, crickets, black soldier flies, to grow. Hmm. Very interesting. I, I, yeah, I, um, yeah. Perhaps I can just add to that. Yeah, I, I do think that this is a, a very new and um, very new area to go into. I, I, do be, I did manage to catch the end of the previous presentation by Lindum. And I think it did uh, share over there that the use of insects, um, I mean, the use of uh, feeding of mixed food waste to insects, for example, is still very much a work in progress. Uh, and it's to, you know, what the output of the insects are. Yeah, and I, I do want to also agree with uh, the other panelists that there is a lot of potential to better and more sustainably manage our food waste. And yes, um, I think these are all areas where uh, private sector innovation would definitely play a role. I do also want to add, though, that there's one very special thing about Singapore that uh, was not mentioned earlier, and it's that we are tropical and hot and humid. <laughs> so that is also another very, very, um, very special um, issue that I, I think we do need to consider. Um, you know, given the hot and humid environment, food waste decomposes quickly, and a very critical imperative of our waste management system is public health. You know, we, we don't want a situation where uh, where waste is you know, left uh, maybe over the course of transportation or storage 
uh, where food where over the course of that process, food waste then starts decomposing and uh, attracting vermin, attracting vectors, which can then create uh, potential public health problems. So, I mean, these are all issues that we need to balance. Mm. Uh, Ola, uh, you have been asking for the word. Yeah, yeah. No, I, uh, it's to, to Kailin. Uh, I, I mean, uh, personally, I, I, I fancy uh, that we look into new applications for, 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 for new business line for, for food waste as a resource. Uh, but I return again to the, uh, to, to, to the nature of, 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 the, of the waste that uh, Christopher also mentioned, you are in a tropical uh, uh, environment. Uh, I could add that waste, you never know what's actually are put into the, 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 the waste bin. Uh, that, and that is very demanding because, uh, for instance, if you go from food waste to food uh, or food waste to f feather or whatever it uh, is, uh, you must control that the, 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 the input is not contaminated with, 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 uh, with, 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 uh, with foreign uh, objects or, or, or even polluted. Uh, so uh, my idea or my opinion is that, okay, you can in solder fly, uh, black solder fly or, or in, in, in other, where you can control the business line all the way then it's, it's maybe the, the one way to go. And we have seen that uh, early on in, 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 in the Nordic countries also that we try to tap out uh, special parts of the, or, 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 or the food, waste, uh, food waste that comes in. Same here, uh, same here. Yes, we only take uh, certain streams of food waste, not all. Exactly, and and uh, today we also tap out, uh, let's say, bread, and can go into the the, the, the pig industry as further, etc. But but again, again, the, the, the if you can't make it profitable, it, it it won't. I don't think that you can survive in in, in the long run, and therefore I'm more uh, and I really really fancy everyone that are exploring the opportunity that lies in in the dig estate. Because when you have turned it and, and, and removed, uh, I mean, all kinds of aliens that enter into to, 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 when you collect food waste and you have made it into a commodity, as I mentioned earlier on, a substrate, as we call it. And if you can extract that again into different business lines, that could be very, very interesting because you have to deal with the big estate one way or the other. I guess that you can put it into uh, incineration, but uh, I mean, that is also a cost and uh, you, you probably have to dewater it or otherwise you, you, you will just chill down the ovens or, or uh, in, the, in the best case. But uh, in my opinion, uh, the, the last, the bottleneck of today's uh, waste to energy in this context is to deal with the dig estate. You must find, and remember that when you take this set out of the digester, it's in a wet form. Mm. And then you have uh, this store. Yeah. So it's a quite complicated, but I, as I said again, uh, just a few, one minute, that yeah. uh, <laughs> I believe, I strongly believe that, that if you put attention to this, you will find new ways to move forward with, with, with Digistate, because there you find the, the, the solution for the future, I guess. Mm. We have a very uh, short time. Um, I, I will, uh, it's both Christopher and Roy, you have asked uh, for, for the word. I, I, do, I just want to ask you to comment a little bit on cooperation, because when we are walk, uh, going into the circular, and they maybe mention how you do uh, uh, enhance or cooperate with partners in the value chain or in the value circle and how important that is. If you can include that in, into your comment, uh, for example, uh, Roy and Ule, if you also mention that uh, later on. And Christopher, just uh, you raised your hand, I think. Yeah, um, yeah, I, so good. If, if you don't mind, uh, perhaps I can just uh, comment on both the issue of collaboration as well as uh, yeah, to try to yeah, respond yeah. to some of um, what was mentioned. Um, I, I do think that there is, you know, as Ula said earlier, there is a lot of food waste in Singapore and there are enough homogenous streams and mixed streams to go around, I'm sure. At least for now, um, as Singapore starts out on um, 
on our food waste journey. I mean, we, we have a lot of guidebooks to try to tell people how they can segregate and treat their food waste. And I mean, and there, there is a lot of potential just for homogenous waste streams, right? Just a couple of quite homogenous waste streams in Singapore are barley spent grains, okara, which is the residue left over after making, uh, after making soya bean um, tofu. So those, those are just some of the larger homogenous food waste streams. And actually those are already homogenous and I would say, you know, why, why should we, we should try to extract as much value out of those and turn it into food or feed, you know, rather than, um, rather than uh, to try to upcycle them instead of recycle them. And so you see, given that there are so many different food streams in Singapore, I mean, not just okara or body span grains, which I talked about, but also other streams such as, um, uh, such as mixed vegetable waste, or even uh, bean sprout farms in Singapore, right? I mean, there, there is, there's a lot of bean sprouts <laughs> to, be, um, to be taken care of. So you see, these are all areas that I think different private sector partners can come together, try to find opportunities. Uh, because uh, in a way, you know, I, of course, I, I would like to say that, gov that our government is wonderful, but at the same time, I do also recognize that there are limits to knowledge. There are limits to knowledge of what um, knowledge that government can have. And the, the, more, the incentives in the private sector are, are very powerful and they can try to drive partnerships between uh, different companies in the private sector, both food waste generators, as well as companies, um, all the companies here, in fact, uh, Ula's, Roy's and Kining's companies, which can then um, find ways to treat those food waste and, and extract as much value as they can from it. Mm. Thank you. Very short from you uh, uh, all about cooperation. I think we are almost over time. I, I can do that very brief. We have been dealing with food waste in the Nordic uh, Scandinavian countries for since, or I was involved in 1996 in Oslo when Oslo uh, implemented the source separation of food waste. Uh, in front of us, within the EU, it will be mandatory source separation of food waste from 2023. You are following in 2024. Of course, that alone uh, calls for collaboration. And I absolutely, uh, seen from, from, from our company, of course we should collaborate to find the best way to treat this kind of, 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 of waste because it's, it, it's the, 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 basically it's the most um, difficult waste to, to deal with. Mm. Right. Yes, I'll try to keep it short. Just a comment on the temperatures, of course. Uh, that's why we need a close collaboration between the is, uh, private industry and the governments, because there needs to be strict legislations regulating how, the, for example, seafood waste is treated, the cooling chains, and perhaps some of it cannot be used, that we need to look at the larger players. But it's working. We're looking at projects in Vietnam. Uh, we are having it running in Japan. So it is possible through collaboration. Another example, we are talking about the, the remaining residues from biogas production. Uh, in Norway, we actually have a <coughs> plant in a, a region called Rogaland, just south of where I'm sitting now, where they collect uh, the municipal wastewater from 13 bigger uh, areas into one place and from uh, into biogas and the uh, re residues are used to produce fertilizer mixed with fish uh, feces and fish feeds. And then they add uh, different minerals and so on to make a complete product. And it's exported to Vietnam used as a fertilizer. So you can, through collaboration between different industries and government, you can make valuable products also from the residues from biogas. But of course you need to lift it a bit up to become a potent fertilizer. Uh, so I believe there is a lot of potentials. I believe the black soldier fly could be a huge potential for the uh, other type of food waste besides seafood, uh, to produce very high uh, larvas rich in proteins and fatty acids that can be used for animal feed. So it's a huge potential that is also now appearing as an industry in Norway. Uh, I just talked with one industry player this morning actually asking us. So there's a there's a lot of opportunities, but it needs a close collaboration between suppliers, competence partners, research institutions, governments, and private industry. Mm -hmm. Absolutely agree, yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, I think I think we need to to close the session. Uh, thank you very much. It was very interesting, and I think I think we were so uh, engaged that we would have continued the discussions if we had more time. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and I, I really encourage you to continue the discussions afterwards and try to find out how to to solve the challenge and how to cooperate on it. I will now uh, present uh, um, uh, Mr. Uh, one of my colleagues. Who is going to close uh, Nikir? Uh, he is a special advisor in Innovation Norway, uh, and throughout his professional career, he has held various roles in management, design, operation, and sales in the technology and healthcare industry. His primary focus is currently on health tech, smart cities, and circular economy. I, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sidhu. Yeah. Very interesting and engaging kind of uh, panel session that we have. And I'm glad that we definitely can continue for further discussion with NEA, local companies, and also Norway companies to see where we can collaborate together. All right. We have heard from the speakers and the panelists that the adoption of the circular economy approach will require measures to take across the entire value chain, from production and consumption to waste and resource management. In at the earlier slot, we have Colorado, who mentioned that Singapore is the first country in Asia to bring uh, to implement DRS. Now I'd like to bring you back to the 60s. I'm a Singaporean who was born in the 60s, and with regards to deposit return scheme and food waste valorization, I would say that these are actually enforced in those days. I don't know whether you are surprised about that. So if you look at the picture, do you see these portals in the pictures and do they look familiar to you? I mean, mostly to the Singaporeans. How many of you actually re remember that FNN, Green Sport, Yoast, Marinda, or even Magnolia? This comes in glass bottles in those days. And we can actually return the glass bottle for five cents refund. And the producer will collect, will wash, and reuse the glass bottles. And today, Bean actually shared, and the research is being done and is actually suggesting 15 cents. And she uh, can actually say in Norway, it has doubled to two kroner, which is about 32 cents in Singapore dollars. And that should really encourage many to do returns. But then uh, after the glass bottles was away, plastic bottles replaced, and it, because it's cheaper and more manageable, that was where washing and raising of these bottles stops and create a huge plastic waste problem. I'm happy today to hear that we are now finally restarting DRS after 60 years by collecting back the bottles. Prof. Sriram and Christopher Tan has actually shared NEA target to implement DRS by 2022 as first phase of extended produce, uh, producer responsibility framework for packaging waste management. Thanks to Prof. Sriram and also to the, from the Plastic Recycling Association of Singapore and so Huiling at Zero Waste SG, Thomas for Alliance to End Plastic Waste, we have helped to bring together organizations, communities, institutes, government agency, and funding to support plastic waste recycling as identified in the Singapore Zero Waste Master Plan. Cha has also shared with us valuable knowledge from Norway, many years of experience in the plate recycling and scheme of aluminum, PET, and bottles and cans. And being from Tomra, actually have made DRS possible with the reverse vending machines and the sorting and the recycling solution. Next slide, please. So what about this next picture? Some of you who were born in the 60s in Singapore must have remembered that in those days, we have many pigs farms in the early years. Back then, food waste valorization is already in place. I remember each household staying in the public housing were given a bin with a cover. We'll dispose the leftover food into a bin and they will be collected daily from this uh, to be used as a pig shell. At the end of the year, we were rewarded with a tray of eggs. But I don't think back then, there are much control in the food waste to be saved for pig use. So we used to feed the food waste to pigs. Now, interestingly, we have insect, insect tech who are actually helping us to feed the food waste to the insect, the black soldier fly. Thank you, Kai. Or even feeding the food waste to magic factory, like what Kel has actually from Lindum has interesting share how Magic Factory were able to turn waste to resource. 
is just like the resurrection of the rotten tomatoes to fresh tomatoes and even future plans for how we can actually survive in Mars. Then we have Christopher from NEA sharing our Singapore Zero Waste Master Plan on e-waste, packaging waste, food waste and recycle right. As he has shared, definitely Singapore being densely populated and having many huge uh, food centers and malls, that does have an advantage in food waste collection. And Ulla from North Biogas, Roy from Belt, has shared other strategies from food waste management. So this year has definitely been a very active year for circular economy in Singapore. And definitely we are seeing real action plans being carried out and regulation being implemented to support various initiatives. In closing, I would I'd like to thank the organization team from MBAS, Norway Embassy and Innovation Norway, our SNIC 2021 partners and sponsors, all the speakers and panelists for their support. And definitely all of you, the audience who are participating online. Although we have come to the end of the two years SNAP program, or sorry, two days SNAP program, but we have much work to do in achieving our goals in circular economy. We need to bring our action together faster. I wish all the best and trust we will meet again in this journey to create a sustainable and scalable circular economy. Remember, waste is not a problem, but a resource. Let's turn waste to value. Thank you for your participation. And that ends our webinar today. For any follow-up, you can always contact us at Innovation Norway, MBAS, or Norway Embassy. Thank you and goodbye.